Hello, everyone. Uh, I've been getting awful, awfully nice comments every now and then on the book, Search for a Nonviolent Future. And I'd like to hear from you also who are watching, sharing these discussions with us, joining, because we're about halfway through the book now and we could readjust, change course and make things useful for you. So the subject that I've been talking about is restorative justice and the role that education can play because education is just sort of a natural antidote to incarceration uh, it, for various reasons. And I quote a Greek proverb on page 152, which means every time you open a prison, you close a school. But that uh, led to a little bit of a discussion, which I was unfortunately still has to be done, which is what is the state of education itself. And from the time when I entered the world of academia until the time that I retired, uh, some of that demoralization that we talked about a while back has really hit the educational system pretty hard. And so if you ask people today, what are you doing here, either teaching or learning or being a janitor or whatever, you will tend to get an answer that it's all about money. So the idea that there is a gold mine within us and that we can develop it through various techniques and that education might be one of them, that has been lost. I'm speaking in broad generalizations, but I think that's something that we all need to take into account. And uh, well, maybe we'll say a good deal more about what, um, how to restore education itself as we go on. But uh, I have been talking about meaning and I said, and I'm going to repeat it because it's so important, that there's almost no way as effective to restore a sense of meaning to life and to restore a sense of human dignity and to restore a sense of human community, all those three things fitting together in a very intimate way, there's almost no more effective way to do that. Maybe I'll take out the almost. I know of no more effective way to do that than with nonviolence. Of course, the minute you begin to think in terms of nonviolence, you see that there is a long, long way to go and you can be demoralized. And that's why I'm bringing in all of these examples of people who have uh, accomplished things through nonviolence and showing how well it works. So uh, the last thing talked about in this section of the book is worth considering and enlarging upon a little bit. And that is that mostly social reformers who have a nonviolent spirit, and I would definitely count Archbishop Romero, Martin Luther King, and very conspicuously Mahatma Gandhi, they tend to be not against stuff so much as they are for some principles which are being overlooked or blocked. And then eventually, if you go about doing these reforms, you will come into conflict with the system. Though I didn't mention it here at this point in the book, what we're actually talking about is two different kinds or two different levels of what we call a constructive program. Constructive program means primarily building what you need rather than waiting for other people to do it for you, rather than protesting or along with protesting against things that you consider wrong, you yourself build what you consider right. So two great examples from Gandhi's campaigns are the charka or the cloth spinning campaign. Maybe later on we can even bring you some kadi that we've made in the meta office, just for a little bit of background here. And the other one was the salt satyagraha uh, because both cloth and salt in different ways had been taken away from the Indians and were being remanufactured and sold back to them by the British, which is just a classic way that colonialism works. And what we do nowadays is you don't even have to conquer the country militarily in order to set up this kind of dependency. 
And very often what a nonviolent actor will do is try to overcome that dependency by creating things. However, these uh, two campaigns, Cadi and SALT, had very different effects because nothing was illegal about manufacturing your own cotton cloth, but it was definitely illegal to gather your own salt. So a constructive program can be done in such a way that it stays completely under the radar, but there is a timing, we again get back on this question of strategy, there is a time at which it becomes important for it to break through and enter into confrontation with uh, the forces of opposition. And when you do that in this systematic way, not by being primarily against, but being primarily for, it puts the onus on the opposition that they are the ones who are obstructing. <clears throat> Recently in the episode that I talked about a while ago, that took place back in June in Congress, where Democratic representatives under the leadership of John Lewis staged a sit-in on the floor of the House of Representatives to bring about gun control legislation. It made the Republicans visible as the obstructing forces in that event. So that is how Constructive Program works. Uh, so far, we've been talking about building up restorative justice in a way which is absolutely non-confrontational. If we keep on with it, a point will come when people who are afraid and clinging to the old system, who don't have the imagination to see this, they will start to push back against the development of restorative justice. And that is going to be a very, very interesting crisis. Thank you very much until we have our next discussion.